we're grateful that you've chosen us and stayed with us. Let's get into our big stories now. And today we focus on education in Ghana. Issues from that sector have taken over the airways for the past three weeks. First, eight children drowned while traveling on the Volta Lake from Atikangome uh, to Wayakope to access education. That was their only crime. We've also had the Ghana Schools of Shame, where we've seen students study without furniture and books in Bandai in the northern region. It's also been on our chopping board, the senior high school placement system, that has uh, also been topical following an investigation by the Fourth Estate that revealed parents were made to pay between eight and 20,000 Ghana cities to get placement for their wards in grade A senior high schools. Well, we had the opportunity of interacting with Dr. Yao Osei Educhum, Education Minister, and this is what he had to share with us. Hello there. Thank you so much for staying here on the AM show and the Joy News channel. You may want to call him the most talked about man of the moment. He's been in the headlines because of some issues that have come to the fore in the education sector. Today, I'll be interacting with Dr. Yao Oseyeduchu, Minister of Education here in Ghana. Thank you so much for allowing us into your office. Thank you for visiting me in my office. And your name has been mentioned on the radio, on the TV, on social media. Do you listen at all and how do you feel about all of that? How do I feel? Mm. I'm always grateful uh, for the opportunity that has been extended to me by the President of the Republic, Nana Dodanko Ekufuado. I'm sitting in this seat as Minister for Education and it's almost, um, when I look back, I feel like I'm dreaming. My background, where I came from, where I grew up. I never grew up thinking I'd be a minister for education. My mom didn't go to school. Dad didn't go to school. I'm a minister for education. I see this as a great opportunity. Divine providence. Uh, uh, like, I express gratitude to the president for giving me this opportunity. So I've never, I've, I've never overwhelmed. I always look at what we'll be able to do and the joy of that gives me the energy to overcome any challenges that come. And I also don't look at what I'm seeing. I'm looking at it and I'm saying, is it a symptom of a, a problem? Mm -hmm. And how do I get to the root of the problem? So I don't spend all my time on the symptom without going to the root cause and then I put him to bed. Uh, the root cause, mm. so that the symptom that we are talking about will no longer exist. Mm. So I don't get overwhelmed at all. Yeah, what do you say to those who say, um, when they hear you speak, they feel that sometimes you talk like you're away from, from the power to solve the problem. So for example, when you spoke at the uh, New Year School at the University of Ghana, Lagos, mm. where you aptly you know, complained about the courses in relation to the skills that the job market needs and why many graduates are unemployable. Um, there were many reactions to that. Some said, why is he talking like one of us? He's the minister in charge. He should be telling us what he's doing to solve the problem instead of complaining. Most of them don't hear the whole story. Mm -hmm. In that New Year, uh, uh, year uh, comment, I was talked about the fact that I've, meet, I've met with vice chancellors, but they don't care to hear that. I told them that I have met with vice chancellors and I've told them that we cannot continue to produce that number of graduates in education because there's no market for them. But they will never play that portion where, where I said I have met with vice chancellors to solve that problem. I'm a problem solver. My training experience is in solving problems. I, I'm not your theoretical PhD holder. I always look at challenges. I see them as opportunities for solution. And therefore, anything that I'll talk about, I prefer solutions and I follow through. I'm a problem solver. I didn't just earn a PhD <laughs> through just research. I develop schools. I build schools from scratch. So if you're talking about a problem solver, even in the United States of America, that is me. I will not talk about anything without preferring solutions and without following through to make sure that we solve 
the problems. Mm. You see, the whole thing is this. When you are head of education in a developing country like Ghana, you really have to look at education as the pathway to socioeconomic transformation. If you complain about something, you are complaining within the context of saying, we could have done it better, and this is how we're going to do it better. And this is what I'm doing to make it better. I've never talked about STEM as if I don't know how to solve it. The president has given me a wonderful opportunity, giving us resources to build STEM schools. We've built STEM labs. We have built science labs in those schools. Mm. We have now opened a portal for students to apply to those schools. I also don't want those schools to wait for 50 years before they become high-performing schools. So if we look at our school at Abomosu, we have transferred an assistant headmaster from Presec to go and head that school. We are incentivizing the space to get some high-performing teachers to go to that school. It's about solution. I will not complain without preferring solution and without following through. But I also feel strongly that sometimes we have to level up with Ghanaians. We can't look at ourselves as part of the establishment, so we are not going to tell what is going on. I think there are times you create the awareness by telling people that there's a sense of urgency, and by the way, this is what is going on. It doesn't mean that you are just talking about it and you are one of them. No, but you have to level up with Ghanaians. Me, I don't believe that if something is wrong, I should hide it because I'm the Minister for Education, I should not tell anybody that this is what is going on. When I have 48 high schools in Ghana, where the pass rate is 1% or less, do I keep that information to myself? No. But I'll tell Ghanaians that there are 48 schools in this country where students who go there have a 0% chance or 1% chance of going to the university and I'm doing intervention in those mm -hmm. schools. Thank God MasterCard Foundation has provided funding. We are going through restructuring of those schools so that the students there can perform better. But people don't want me to talk about it. Why should I talk about it? I should. To create a sense of agency for all of us that something is not right and we need to fix it. But I'm a fixer. <laughs> I'm not a talker. So if something is not right, I'll talk about it. But okay. if they follow me, they will see that I'm doing something about what I'm talking about. Mm. Do, you, do you find it more difficult to fix what the problems are that you see here than it was for you to fix the problems in the U.S., for example? Interestingly, it's the reverse. It's much easier here. Okay. Much, much easier here. Why do I say that? Because, you see, when in education, the, a component that we always miss is the student. The student factor is what may help you transform or not be able to transform. In Ghana, we have students who are so respectful. Uh, these are students literally will do whatever you ask them to do. You walk into a classroom and they will stand up. I mean, they are respectful to a fault. If you ask, don't ask them to sit, they may not sit. These are the students that we are working with. And if you find a way to motivate and excite them, they will do more for you than you can get students in America to do for you. So bringing about transformation, we also have to understand that change is difficult. But we have to find a way to incentivize the ecosystem for change to be possible. That is what is done in America more than here. So instead of issuing directives that I'm the minister, and I want to make sure everybody does this, it's better to look at what incentive am I creating for people to do what they will normally not do. And I'll give you one example. Uh, we know in Ghana, for all this time, if you do not do science, you will never get the opportunity to do medicine, to do engineering.
you, do, you dare not dream about it. But I've seen Ghanaians, one Ghanaian in particular, who did archaeology at Legon, came to America, and now he's a cardiologist. Because the system offered him the second chance to say that if you want to do medicine, irrespective of what you did in high school or maybe at your undergraduate, can you take courses in biology, chemistry? And if you are proficient in it, can you sit for the entrance exam to school of medicine? And if you pass it, we really don't care. What your background is. Yes. Because you've proven to us that you are capable. Now, if I come to this seat and I tell universities, allow those who did not do science to have opportunity for pre-engineering, allow them to go into engineering, think I'm the minister, therefore whatever I say people should do, they're going to rebuff me. You're going to have a situation where they may even go on strike against you. So what did I have to do? I had to create a grant program through GTEC, which is the agency in charge of tertiary education. And we offered an incentive for those who want to try, those who want to create a model, a pilot program. A number of universities wrote proposals. Two of them were selected. And as I speak with you, at UMAT, if you did not do science in high school, you have an opportunity to do a pre-engineering program for one year. And from there, if you pass the exams and you are deemed eligible for level 100 engineering, you are allowed to move on to do engineering. So that's almost like pre-med and medicine Very in other jurisdictions. In other jurisdictions. Mm. So my whole thing is this. Change is possible, but I look at my experience in America, I look at my experience here. What Americans do better probably than us is how they incentivize change. They give you an incentive to do something that you normally not do. And that is the only difference. Other than that, I will even say that it's easier to bring about change in the education system in Ghana mm. than probably um, in America. Mm. Let's focus on STEM education because you spoke about that. Mm -hmm. And we know that for the crop of students who just mm. finished their BEC, mm. they have the opportunity yes. to apply to the STEM schools, schools that have been completed. And mm -hmm. many people have lauded that initiative. In fact, for me, it's, it's exciting seeing how young people are getting interested in STEM by the day, obviously, through <laughs> policy formation and the interest of private sector in helping to drive mm -hmm, that mm -hmm, agenda. Mm -hmm. But do our STEM schools, mm. do we have a working policy document? Is mm -hmm. there anything that is guiding mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the operation of STEM mm -hmm. schools as mm -hmm. we speak and mm -hmm. the curriculum, mm -hmm. etc.? Yes, we do. And in fact, it will be interesting to note that um, other West African countries were doing engineering sciences in high school. Uh, Nigeria and Sierra Leone were doing through WIAC. So we've taken that syllabus from WIAC. Okay. And now that is what is guiding our high school end of things in terms of our STEM. Okay. So now what, we do, we're, what we're doing here, that was different from what may be happening in other places, that uh, we have to do all the robotic activities, the programming activities associated with the different units of the engineering sciences curriculum. We are working with WIAC in such a way that our exams will have a more practical orientation than the regular exams in physics or chemistry. You see, one interesting thing is that if you look at a school like Manfi Methodist Girls, they've won awards across the world. But those young women who have done so well will have nothing on paper in right. terms of records as Manfi Methodist Girls in order to show any university that bring me in and my transcript shows that I did robotics. So the new policy would address that? Yes. You see, the new policy is going to allow this young woman, let's say at Manfi Methodist Girls, to take a class in robotics. Mm. So instead of it being a fun activity after school activity, it's a course that they're enrolled in. And this is available to all students, no matter what course you're, 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 you're pursuing in high school. As, so, as I did visual arts, for example. Yes. So as a visual arts student, if I took a, a course in robotics, will that be allowed? And will I get that document? You know, is there, that what the policy says? There are two pathways. One pathway is for students who are going to 
do STEM as their career pathway. Within the context of STEM, you have some who may do biomedical sciences, you may those who may do aviation and aeronautical sciences, you have those who may do engineering. Then the another pathway is for you to take an elective course, irrespective of whether you are doing visual arts or home economics. You can also do, or you do in science, for example, you can do an elective in robotics. But we are not talking about course that you have to do for three years. You know, in Ghana, one of the limiting factors in our high school education system is the fact that every course that you do, you have to do it for three years. So it doesn't offer the opportunity and flexibility for students to take, do a one-year course in music, visual arts for one year, so that they, they, are, uh, they know how to draw. So that in case they go to the university and they are doing engineering drawing, they will have exposed to it in high school. So in other jurisdictions, if you are taking electives, you don't have to take one elective and do it for three years. So when it comes to robotics, for example, if you are doing home economics, you can do it. But you couldn't do it for one year and not three years. And another year, you may decide to do music. And I'm asking, mm -hmm. is this what the policy document says? Yes. Because we've, mm -hmm. we've tried to access mm -hmm. the document. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. know if it's been published. Oh, no, they can. They, they, it's not been published. OK. Uh, it's within the ministry now. We've done a lot of stakeholder consultation. It's at the final stage um, in terms of publication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you, you can have access to it. They can and, and one of the reasons we are interested mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. for example, with the standardization examination mm -hmm. that we saw NST. In, in, for, for the primary mm -hmm. four students, it appeared to be quite untidy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't fitting in the schedule. And there were some children who got it quite late. So I'm just, I'm just thinking, are we ready for this? Aren't we ration things? Are we sure that this crop of students who just with the BEC mm -hmm. will fit into the system and the system mm -hmm. is well established to receive them? System is more than, and probably the system is more than ready to receive this crop of students for STEM than any other time. Why? How many schools have 12 science labs in, in this country? No school. From Wesley Girls. Now we created six science labs there that gives them nine science labs, the school with the highest number of science laboratories. You have schools that have 12 science labs completed. And if they are not ready for a STEM student, then no school will be ever be ready for STEM students anywhere in the world. So the, the, the way the schools have been built, it was built for them. The logistics that have been provided, now they are fitting, the, uh, they, they are making sure library is done. And that's the new normal in Ghana. Any new school that we're doing will have its library equipped before the school begins. Science lab done before the school begins. So there's no doubt in my mind that these schools are better equipped than any other school in terms of receiving STEM of students. Mm. So, so that is not a concern and shouldn't be a concern in terms of our STEM. Mm. Uh, you, you talk about NST. Um, I don't think it was so pervasive everywhere. But yes, uh, you may have those challenges when you are administering exams for the first time uh, for primary four students, primary two students across the country. But primary two, you know, they did it on a tablet. And the tablets were all deployed across the country because not every school had their own tablets. And I think for the most part, it went well. Um, but yes, you always have to give yourself the opportunity to improve. So there might be some gaps. For example, this was the first time NACA was doing census exam, exams that are administered to every single student. You know, for the most part, it's a random kind of exam, random mm -hmm. sampling. Um, so a, a number of times, you don't have a situation where every student is being examined. So when that is going on, the pressure is different from where we are saying every single student should be examined. So over 500 other uh, private schools were added. So they have about 700,000 students. And NACA is a pretty young organization, and they have to assess everyone. So yes, there might have been challenges in certain places. But I think for the most part, if we give them some guidance and support them, they will do a better job next time. Right. Let's focus a bit more on free SHS now, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because the pair are checks. There have been concerns about feeding students in the high school. Um, it's, it's a major problem, um, Doc, and I, I, 
I don't know, but it appears that every time the issue is raised, it's, it's almost treated as though the problem didn't exist. And in cases where there was some form of admission made, it was treated as a trite, oh, we have, we have, we've distributed, oh, we're sending money. Mm -hmm. Last year, you spoke about how much was owed um, in terms of feeding, and it was about some 340 million CDs. How much of that has been paid, and is that... Is that not the real problem? Is that not at the heart of the problem? Last week, 290 million was released. 290 million, it's not chicken change. So I, I'm very grateful to the Minister of Finance for stepping up to make sure buffer stock uh, gets the resources that it needs to pay suppliers. And you can check in with them and know that they are paying, beginning from today, they are paying vendors that they've owed sometime for a year or so, they are paying them. You see, the food crisis that happened, I was the first to admit that there were challenges. And the reason why the challenges came about was when the inflation rate went up. Most suppliers then, we can't do 60 day credit supplies anymore. So it became a situation where I'm willing to supply, but I can wait for 60 days. So if you've done a cash flow plan based on 30 and 60 days, of course, you are caught off guard. And you could understand why they also were hesitant to supply. So we literally had to get to a situation where we were getting two weeks of supply and it was going on in such a way that we will make sure that there was food in the schools when the other suppliers were saying, uh-uh, I can't wait longer. If you don't pay me cash, I'm not supplying. And I admitted that that was the crux of the problem, the reason why that crisis came about uh, for buffer stock to go through what they were going through at the time was that they had a challenge with the whole supply chain management system. Buffer stock over the years have done well, but they confronted a major crisis and how to deal with it in the short term uh, became a major uh, concern of theirs. And therefore, it impacted us. As the Minister for Education, I'm not in charge of food supply. There's a government agency that has expertise in that field. But they work for me, uh, not because they are under me, they are the Ministry of Agri. When there's a crisis, it hits me because when they do well, I benefit uh, from the work that they are doing. So when this comes up, what I do is to do whatever I can uh, to ensure that means of finance will support and when the monies come, of course, they're able to pay the various suppliers. As I said, I'm very grateful to, for, uh, to the Minister of Finance that within a week they were able to release 290 million. Uh, in December, they released 120 million. Uh, so, arrears from 2021 is cleared, arrears for 2022 literally almost cleared. Uh, with that, buffer stock has the muzzle and, and to begin to do. Uh, the good work that they've done for us uh, over the years. Mm. Um, during the time uh, the, the food shortage in the senior high schools was, mm -hmm. was at its peak, if mm -hmm. I may say, we heard from parents, mm -hmm. we heard from mm -hmm. stakeholders who mm -hmm. say, look, mm -hmm. can you just mm -hmm. review the whole program? Mm -hmm. Okay, because this is also bringing so much burden to mm -hmm. government, having to pay for literally mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. for, for students in public mm -hmm. um, senior high schools in the country. Mm -hmm. And they say, look, you've done well, you've, you've mm -hmm. shouldered it mm -hmm. for some time, but we think that you should open the policy up for review. Mm -hmm. It's been mm -hmm. how many years already? And mm -hmm. ideally you would want to see some assessment being done, you know, identifying what the shortfalls are and you know, correct. Why, why are we hesitant in reviewing the free senior high school program? You see, if you sit where I sit, you are in charge and you know the challenges, you know the root causes. If you sit where you sit, you look outside in and you see also the challenges that are there. But we will come to different conclusions looking at the challenges. By the same challenges that we are looking at. You see, if I look at budget allocations and releases, and I see that there's no money. It's a different story from when you have a cash flow issue. There's a difference between wealth, money, 
and cash flow. You may have money sitting here. If it doesn't come in a timely fashion, it can give you a headache. It doesn't mean you don't have money. But if you don't have money at all, you make certain kind of decisions. So when people are saying, stop, let's look at this. I'm looking and saying, you know what? Money will come. And as I said, 290 million was released to me to take care of supplies. But while we so, wait so, for that money to come, there mm -hmm. are a lot mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. students who complain about mm -hmm. how difficult it is mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. Some talking about having to eat one ladle mm -hmm. of rice a day. Mm -hmm. Some saying the food is inadequate. We are not you being see, served proper see, portions. So, mm -hmm. I mean, Doc, but, and admittedly, reviewing a program doesn't necessarily mean that mm -hmm. it is in crisis or it is wrong. It's, it's just a proper thing to do after implementing something for so long. It's a novelty. I mean, we, we have never had anything like this. There were those who were advocating a progressive system, but your government thought otherwise and said, no, we can do it instantly. And you did it. There have been concerns. Parents have spoken. We've heard from some of the students. Why does it appear that there's such a resistance to reviewing the policy? I, I, I don't know what resistance uh, most of you talk about. I say I've, I have a set of facts that you don't have. If I have a crisis today, I walk into the president's office. President says, finance minister, find the education minister money. That's a conversation between me, the president, mm. and finance minister. You are not privy to that. So whilst you are advocating that why don't you do this, I know that money is coming in three days, right? Money is coming in two weeks. Consequently, because you are not privy to that, and I can announce to you, you are going to come to a different conclusion from the conclusion I will come to. But so these so, so the 290 death. million mm. that got released, mm. the money has come. Yes. So, so you were not privy mm. to the fact that the money was coming, so I can understand why. But there, there's mm -hmm. been so much fluctuation in the system. So if it was, it w if it was a problem that you know, occurred and didn't happen again, then you could say, okay, fine. But it appears to come and go, I, come I, and I, go, and I, it appears to be on an ending cycle. There will be an end. When? And I can assure you, the allotment is coming this year. You see a different Ministry of Education, different buffer stock. We'll put an end to the shortages. I know what I'm talking about. And you, and know, you can come back here three months and review mm, with me and this I, statement. I'm not, I don't want to sound pessimistic, but when you look at mm -hmm. the general economy and where we no. find ourselves, is that, to when, suggest, when, when you, is that to suggest that the Ministry of Education mm -hmm. is, is having a different... Uh, experience than what the entire nation is experiencing and, and where would you I'll get the support I'll from? tell you yes because of the priority that this president has placed on education when I tell you that about 70 school facilities are under construction now 10 colleges technical colleges are under construction in this crisis it should tell you something mm. that this president has put so much premium on education that even in the time of crisis he's saying Education must soldier on. We must make sure that the long-term, medium-term solution to our economic challenges is taken care of. So, so the, the issue is this. Education has a priority, and I'm so fortunate to be the minister for education. My ministry has priority. And you're going to see changes happening in many spaces where there has been some kind of concern, especially with food supplies. You can come here. Three months from now, we'll do a follow-up interview, and you'll be able to see that what I said has come to pass. Mm. I don't make promises I can't fulfill. So I've been assured that the support will come. I've seen mm. that support is coming. Consequently, I have different set of facts to make my decision based on, to respond to you, and uh, you just have to uh, come back and hold me accountable. The other thing has to do with the quality of students being churned out. We've had interaction with some lecturers, you know, uh, people who run the university, universities who say, to be honest with you, we are seeing a new crop of students coming to our universities who do not seem to have the quality that we require. So when they come, it's almost like taking them back to the basics. So there's the issue with the, with the food supply, there's the issue with the the payments of teachers, et cetera. Then there's the issue about the quality. Quality mm. in this country. When was the last time we have 60% of our students passing the WASI across the board in A1 to C6? Upon what basis are we making that kind of a statement? 
This is the first time in eight years where on the WASI, 60% of the students have a pass, A1 to C6, in all core subjects. And Go so to St. James. That, so for no, you, there's no, no issue of quality? Of course. There has been a, a tremendous improvement in quality of our students. Go to St. James and see what is going on. An oasis of excellence, St. James in Sunyane. Top student in WASI came from the school this year. The second best student in WASI in West Africa came from St. James this year. Oasis of excellence in a number of schools that you may never have heard of. Ola girls, Kenyans, you go there and see what is going on. The schools, Keta, right? Mm -hmm. The girl yeah. who did so well. Based, yeah, based on what I've heard, even in Harvard, look at her performance. Mm -hmm. So, so we have students from adults, so all these uh, villages like mine, but some train villages, they go places and they shine. Let me tell you, the, the thing is, we make so many statements without facts and not anecdotal evidence from what a professor may say. But the facts, based on which those statements are made, it depends upon who is talking. This is why you had an issue with our schools of shame story, because as you're speaking and smiling and talking about oasis of excellence, I couldn't help but just remember that famous speech about the schools of fame and not schools of shame. There are those who have said, admittedly, there are good things happening, but that does not mean that light must not be shown on the underprivileged and those who may ordinarily not have an opportunity to tell their story, but for the media. I agree with you. So the fact that schools of I, fame I agree, and I, oasis of excellence I agree, uh, I exist. Agree, I agree with your previous statement. Which is? Uh, whatever you said. I agree with you. So, <laughs> so on, on, on that stage, when you were speaking to the young people, some of whom I've interacted with after that G-Step program, very you know, exciting young people who want to solve problems, there was an opportunity for you to address the issues highlighted in the schools of shame. Um, but instead, you chose to question why we decided to tell I, that I, story. I, I, but, I, but I'll I, give you the opportunity now to tell us. What, what opportunity? Uh, this opportunity to talk to the Ghanaian people, to hear from and you also, as minister also, maybe on, on, on what is being done to address the issue of lack of furniture mm -hmm. in, in these schools, some of them in the northern part of Ghana, others in the southern sector, but, but largely largely in the northern part of Ghana, if you're able to tell us we've, what is being done. Okay. We've never stopped distributing furniture across the country. Furniture has been... Is it distributed been, evenly? Oh, yes. Some places have more challenges than others, so you can understand. But we have distributed furniture across the country. Mm -hmm. As I speak with you, tomorrow, uh, about 5,000 pieces of furniture is going to Pandai. Okay. It will be loading tomorrow, okay. heading to some of the areas that have serious challenges. Was this mm -hmm. after the documentary or you were aware of the Pandai situation? I mean, I mean, you highlighted it. And I agree with you that when you highlight a problem, we should solve them. So I'm a fixer. So when you highlight a problem, I'll go and I'll solve them. Are your people mm -hmm. in the chain, i.e., there's an MC there, there's a district yes. director oh, yeah. of education. It's going through the they... regional director yes. who, when I spoke with, had just returned from Pandai, and he's liaising with the MC and the district director through the head teachers. So they are doing their compilation as to where the challenges are, because obviously it's not every school. Right. So what they are doing now, they are doing the compiling. So by the time it hits there, the regional minister will be there, and they will look at their list and distribute it to the schools that need the help. Um, so there, there's a plan, the regional minister. The good news is that when I call him, he had just returned from there. So he so said, I just returned from Pandai. Mm -hmm. So they are doing the compilation, and they will be able to uh, help schools that need it. Obviously, there are some schools that may not need the help. Would you say they are proactive enough in solving this problem? Because they are your reps there. Of course, your eyes can be everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, would it have been solved earlier if it had been brought to your attention? I mean, I'll tell you this. I grew up in a very poor part of town, right? Um, 
when you talk about empathy for those who are less privileged, I think one of the people that will be more empathetic than anybody, I don't want to see children sleeping on the floor and writing. I want them to have opportunities that I have today, even though I grew up very poor, I want them to see Dr. Duchum as somebody that they, they can uh, be like or even become better than. And under that circumstances, I want to make sure that that situation is not repeating anywhere in the country. So we're looking at all means possible to ensure that no child go to school and have to sit on the floor or lie down uh, to write. It is not right, and we'll do everything possible to stop it. We have various uh, scenarios that we are looking at in terms of we have technical colleges and uh, technical schools that do carpentry, and we're working with now we are approaching Forestry Commission to look at how we can get wood for them uh, so that we can truly uh, solve the problem once and for all. I believe in solving problems. I don't believe in so, so much about um, disputing and no, that is not me. You see, how people took my statement out of context. It was amazing when I saw that they took the statement and then photoshopped it into... Rather. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And photo to make it appear that I was saying that those schools were schools of fame. How no, would I say you, that? You actually meant the kids who were sitting in front of no, you. No, no. Yes. We, I meant the kids, kids. or Dara Basic School mm. and what they had accomplished. Mm. And I said, these are schools of fame. You've mm. done so well. Look at Wadara. Wadara, the name is Wadara Barracks mm -hmm. in Kumasi. Mm. And they are a public basic school. And, and I really want to commend you. I found out later that the GSTEP program is fully sponsored in terms of media, mm. sponsored by Joy News. And you've done an excellent job supporting my brother from Dream Over in making this a world-class uh, exhibition and, and competition. Mm. So I was amazed, especially when I went to one of the exhibition booths and saw somebody who had been burnt from a leakage of LPG gas cylinder and unfortunately had passed away. And the student told me our motivation for doing this is that we don't want what happened to this person who was lying there motionless at the time and then later on passed, that we don't want this to happen to anybody. And we have invented this device that can tell you in your home that there's a leakage of gas and it can be for you to know that you need not enter that space with anything that can that, that, that is flammable. I was seriously touched. I was super excited to see that this country is in better hands if we can push them, push it to such a way that primary, primary school and junior high school children are doing things that if we commercialize, will not only create jobs but save lives. So I was seriously touched. And I refer to them and the schools that they come from as schools of fame. But when I pointed, somebody made me point to schools where children were lying on the floor to make it appear that, that those were the schools I was referring to. I was referring to Wadara. I was referring to a number of students from greater Accra region who participated in the exhibition and, and gave me hope that the better days of this country is ahead of us and not behind us. So how are we hoping to, beyond giving furniture to schools mm -hmm. in, 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 in deprived communities mm -hmm. in the country, how are we hoping to make them also schools of fame? One, we have to look at infrastructure in terms of the building. And I'm so grateful to the Arab Development Bank for the funding that they've provided for us to build some schools across the country. Um, I, it gives me such a great pleasure looking at where the construction is and how it's going. And I, I've actually talked to a fr one friend of mine who works at Joy that I want to take Joy on uh, to go and see these facilities and, and shine some light on those new facilities under construction. <laughs> Interesting. If you, just, if you just joined us, I've been speaking to the Minister for Education, Dr. Yawasey Duchuman. We've been um, discussing major happenings within the space. I'm, I'm sure you want to hear about the, the famous school placement saga, <laughs> but the minister says he will speak 
in his own time at the right time. So we, we will be staying in touch with him and we'll let you know once that happens. But um, the other thing about the schools of shame is the provision of textbooks for the new curriculum. And this is the other thing, Doc. Fantastic ideas, the people say. Brilliant projects, poor execution. Since 2019, we introduced this new curriculum. We've had promises upon promises. And they say, how do you expect us as teachers to execute our mandate? We do not have the textbook so far. We heard from the president of NAT that only three textbooks have been provided across the board. The Why are the, we doing this to ourselves? The, Why? La the last time I checked, it was four core textbooks. Okay. And I think the fifth one has also uh, been procured. You see, the thing is this. Didn't in we the put past, the cart? In the, no, not really. Didn't in the we past, put the cart before the horse then? No, no. You see, it is a different approach. In the past, uh, we have no focus on one-to-one -one curriculum procurement. So invariably, uh, you're going to have two students sharing a book. We decided that it should rather be one-to-one. -one. So it takes more effort to do one-to-one -one textbook deployment. But were you ready for that? 2019 to 2023, that's four solid 20, years. That, but the books went in 2022, so don't add the one year for me. Okay, three <laughs> solid years. That's enough time. That's enough, so, time, so for, don't, don't, for, that's don't. enough time for a child to grow, walk, you see, and run. You see, you, see, you see, the interesting thing about this is that uh, we as a country, unlike other countries, decided that we allow the private sector to develop the textbooks so we want to allow the private sector. See, 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 let me tell you this. In the old system where the ministry had writers, right? And they were writing. It took such a shorter period of time to get textbooks in all classrooms. So clearly that was but a better system. Is that not in it? In terms of the speed, but I also have a, a philosophical understanding that was developed over the years that the private sector should be allowed to develop in the book industry. That is not to say that this could not have been done faster. So I'll concede that in the future, this has taught us some useful lessons that you really have to fast track a lot of things to make sure even if it's private sector development, you can shorten the procurement and other processes so it doesn't drag on forever. Uh, so yes, I'll concede, but you also know that they develop what they call learner packs for the teachers uh, for the first two years before the third year came and textbook started going. So it's not as if nothing at all was given to the teacher. And if you talk to the teachers, they will tell you that there's something called learner packs, materials of activity exercises that were developed uh, for teachers to use in their various classrooms. But from where I said, I concede that we should do a better job in terms of fast tracking so you don't have that missing link and gaps in terms of new curricula and then deployment of textbooks. So I, I, I agree how long that do we, we could do a better job. How long do we have to wait for the rest of the textbooks to be released and given to these? Oh, no, we are going through students. the procurement processes now. So I'll update you. Since you've come to my office and you asked me this coin, I owe it to you to break the news to you so that there will be one day on your show the breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. So, um, Ghanaian, Ghanaian school children mm -hmm. go through quite a lot. Admittedly, mm -hmm. there are great strides that have been made. Mm -hmm. And I said on my show, on the day that, um, the day after mm -hmm. your famous School of Fame comment, mm -hmm. that we've shown the light on some of them. I mean, even your personal projects talk about giving scholarships going to teach in the classrooms. We were there with you, but we will still tell the stories of the vulnerable. There was an incident of the Water Lake which claimed... Eight lives. Eight lives. Precious poor little, lives. Poor little children. Precious and lives. I, I wonder um, how, how that made you feel and what's the big plan? Because then later there were conversations about getting life jackets and the attitude of parents towards that. 
But that doesn't solve the problem, does it? We, we've looked at the community where, from where the children uh, were traveling and going to another place. We've looked at the numbers, and they deserve a school. So next week, we'll begin a procurement process through the PPA to make sure we can begin construction of a school. Mm -hmm. Because the numbers that you're giving us is 98 students. They can, there can be a school for them. Once so, that, again, so it's not about mm -hmm. life jackets mm -hmm. and all those things. You see, one of the things that we as a nation have not done a better job at is education planning. At this ministry, there's not, <laughs> now we have it, but there was never a place for somebody who sits down and say that we need to plant a school here, we need to have a school here because of population, and we are mapping it, and now with GPS, we'll be able to map it electronically to be able to know that Kasua needs more school. This place, based on census data, there has to be a school here. So that is why sometimes I talk about, if you are not careful, you'll be sucked into the symptoms. But the real root cause of most of these things is the fact that we are not planning for education the way other countries have done. Maybe they will say this is also uh, um, complaining. Mm -hmm. But what we are doing now is that we have put together and civil service have given the opportunity to clear that planning unit with staff so that we can begin to say that this community needs a school mm -hmm. and this community must have a school and then you can target your resources uh, towards that. So this community, based on the number of students who come from there, about 800 people live there. Uh, you have 98 students from that community. They more than deserve a school of their own. So before we talk about life jackets and other things, what we also have to seriously look at at this current time is how do we uh, develop a school there on a very fast pace uh, to ensure that within the next three to four months, they have a school of their own and therefore don't even need to get out and wait at the bank of a river to get into to this horrible, terrible uh, disaster that our, our nation uh, witnessed. Mm -hmm. So essentially, um, I felt terrible, um, especially when children are going to school. If they were doing any other thing, uh, it, was, it will still hurt you. But when they are trying to have a better future for themselves, and they are going to school, mm -hmm. when this happens, it hurts us. And it's something that we all have to learn from. We're also um, going to have a meeting with district directors in areas like that to begin to look at what our short-term, long-term strategies are so that children don't get into harm's way, are doing the right thing that we expect them to do, that is to go to school. Uh, so um, I believe that the lives of these eight precious children who have lost should not be in vain. If we are able to prevent a future disaster, then even though we've lost them and may their souls rest in peace, we we'll have also vowed to ourselves as a nation that what happened to these children will not happen to any other children. So we need to begin to look at districts where uh, crossing a river, walking through, through streams, it's a daily occurrence. And I think, if anything, we should wake up and understand that this is something that should not be occurring in this country. So I'm taking this seriously. The Director General of Ghana Education Service is inviting district directors in all areas where you have these island communities uh, to look at what we need to do. If we can build a school, what do we need to do to provide them education? Uh, but um, even if it's a one-room school where you have multiple ages in the same room, it's better uh, to have them in that situation than for them to risk their lives. Um, for, for this government in particular, and, and I say this because we interact with the people, we get concerns raised, it, it appears for some people that philanthropy is not really welcome. And they say this because... Um, over the times they've tried intervening, especially with free SHS, because that appears to be the heart. I mean, don't touch free SHS. Don't try to contribute to help us. We'll do everything on our own. And so it appears that in cases where ideally people will step up to say, 
let's, let's, let's mobilize, let's help solve the problem. Let's build a school, let's paint the classrooms, let's provide furniture. It appears that people are very hesitant because they're like, well, they want to do it on their own, let them do it. Um, how will you address that concern? I think it's a very unfair characterization of our government. Is it? Yes, very unfair. Very unfair, especially at this Ministry of Education. We have big win philanthropy that is helping us. Mastercard Foundation. No, that those is are coming. bigger institutions. No, no, I'm not, talking about ordinary no, but who people who has ever come to, to this ministry and wants to mobilize, and the minister for education says, "I'm not willing to talk to you." If you can get one person who says, "I went to the minister and I was ready to do a campaign to build a school," a minister said he didn't need my support. If you can get one of them, I'll be able to meet that person and probably say, "Come." And if I did that, I apologize to you. There's never a time that somebody has come here and says, I'm willing to build a school, and I'll tell the person, I don't need your help. So it's never true, and it's as an unfair characterization of my government that we refuse support from uh, other people. Ghana Gas is doing an excellent job building schools. Sometimes they invite us when they're about to open. We don't even determine where to put it. There are so many individuals, Magdan and others, who have built schools, and we appreciate them. So I, I, I don't think it's fair to say my government. Uh, we appreciate it. My doors are open. Anybody, if you are hearing me on this show, if you want to support, team up with your church to build a school in your village. I'm ready to support you. So after you build, if you want me to bring you furniture, I'll bring you furniture. If you want me to come there, and help open the school. As the Mrs. Jackson from Jackson College did recently uh, in a village in Asantiachem, mobilize her own resources as a corporate social responsibility. Mrs. Jackson went to that village and built a school there. I'm happy to hear those uh, stories. It's heartwarming to know that we want to be uh, our brother's keeper, and I'm willing to support that effort. And I also know that Joy News have mobile resources and you have been doing a great job helping build schools. I, support, I will support you and I commend you for that effort. So please, if there's some misconception out there about our government not bringing in people, tell them it may just be a misconception. I'm ready, willing, and able to support anybody who wants to support education in this country. It's about our children. It's not about me. It's about our children. And I know how it is to go to a school in a dilapidated building. And I don't want children in this country to go through that. So we welcome everyone who wants to support to turn things around and make schools a better learning environment for our children. We'll be wrapping up the conversation shortly. Um, this is the AM show. And I've been speaking to Dr. Yawase Duchu, Minister in Charge of Education, and he's been responding to some questions on major happenings within the education space. But um, quickly in wrapping up, um, I would like to find out from you, it appears the Free Senior High School Program, which is government's flagship program, has shrouded the many other things that this government said it was going to do within the sector. So, for example, 16 free senior high school, or schools built in Zongo communities. You, you speak about Gallup. And are you able to give us an update on those ones? Gallup? Yeah. Yeah, Gallup is galloping. <laughs> <laughs> 10,500 schools get special kind of funding. And these are the lowest performing schools in the country uh, at the basic level. Mm. And they get special funding uh, from the World Bank. In addition to that, special training is offered uh, to their teachers. So Gallup uh, is going well. Um, I think we are seeing a situation where we can lift these children up to a high level. You know, the World Bank talks about learning poverty, and they are saying that in developing countries, about 87% of students at age 10, which is like primary four, cannot read proficiently. We want to turn that around. And, and do a better job so that we don't become one of the, those countries that the World Bank uh, refers to as suffering from learning uh, poverty. Gallup is to help us do that. Beyond that, we also uh, have funding from our Big Win uh, philanthropy, and we are 
working on what is called communities of excellence. We take over a village, and our goal is to make sure that by age 10, primary 4, 90%, at least 90% of the students there can read proficiently. And then we follow those children to high school, and from junior high to high school, 90% will move on. And then in that village, we expect to see 90% transitioning from high school uh, then to a uh, tertiary uh, institution of their choice. When we're able to do that, that community within the next 10 to 20 years is forever transformed through education. So yes, um, things are shifting and changing at that level. But of course, there's always room for improvement. You're not going to be able to fix everything, but you have to work at it and have to have a vision of what leads to transformation. Um, in a developing country like ours, I think education should be seen as a means to an end and not an end in itself, mm. that we are just going to school. And that is why quality education is important, but so is relevance of the education system to the needs of the country. And that is what I was speaking to in, at the New Year school. That is not enough for us to have more students going through tertiary. What they are doing there should be of interest to us. We are now, uh, with GES, looking at counseling as a critical element of what you do in high school and even junior high school, given the nature of our education system, where 12 year old, 13 year old, 14 year olds make a decision to do visual arts, for example. And then we tell them that you don't have the right to change your mind. Because you decided that you want to do visual arts, even if you have an epiphany, and, and you want to become a medical doctor in this country, you will never be. Our goal is to make sure we create an education system that is relevant to the needs of our country. We should allow the youth, children, at a certain age, be able to change their minds and say that because the nation needs more medical doctors, more engineers, I did visual arts, but I'm willing to transition. Give them a helping hand. Because by the way, it's not because you did visual arts. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you one thing. I think the visual arts student is the most creative mind we have in this country. If they don't find themselves in our engineering schools, they don't find themselves in our pool of engineers in this country, engineering becomes just a simple mathematical exercise. If you're talking about innovation, what that engineering is about, who better be an engineer than the person who can imagine and look at you and draw you, look a design bridge, I tell you that there can be a new airplane. Those are the individuals who should find them, uh, themselves in the engineering innovation space. Mm. So our point is that we need to position our education system that it's not enough to allow everybody to go. When they go, quality should improve, but that is not enough. The education that they are receiving should be relevant to their needs as individuals, to the needs of their families, and the needs of their country. And when there's that total alignment, that is when education performs its rightful role as the most important vehicle for socioeconomic transformation. Any update on the 16 senior high schools in Zongo communities across the country? How many have been completed? How many have we been have started? Not, we have not begun. When do you hope to do so? You've got just two years to end this term. Just two years. And at this time, you're putting pressure on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we were working with um, uh, a certain nation uh, that promised initially to provide the resources. Things did not go the way it should, but we still haven't given up. Which nation is this? I will not be able to disclose. Okay. There's an international platform. Join this international platform. Okay. I don't want that country to come after me and say, you said okay. we didn't deliver. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, so, so in, in, in wrapping up this conversation, and once again, let me just say that I know that you're expecting to hear the minister speak about that famous uh, <laughs> uh, school placement sale documentary produced by Fourth Estate. He's asked us to give him more time, and he will speak at the right time. So um, at the right time, you will hear from him, and I'm sure it will be on this platform as well. You are supporting some young people from your constituency. And don't forget that he's an MP as well. It, I think that people forget that most yeah. of the time. Mm -hmm. So you are helping young people who want to do engineering yes. in and your medicine. constituency in medicine, uh, sponsored quite a number of them, about 60 of them? Or oh, no, no. This year we've added some more, so we have about 130. Okay, so 130, 130 of them. Mm -hmm. Tell us what the big dream is and what your expectation, especially, is of these persons who are receiving the support. You see, um, 
Through Free Senior High School, a number of students in various villages have gotten the opportunity of a lifetime to have secondary education. And um, you go to almost every village now, somebody has graduated from high school. It didn't used to be that way when we were growing up. Uh, but invariably, they have challenges with funding as to how to move on. So in Bosom Train, I saw that opportunity everywhere. I go to every village to visit, and the parents will come to me and say, I want my son uh, to go to police. I said, why? Oh, I look at the results, and I look at the results, and it's so good in science. And, and I asked, Mom, why is it I want him to go to, oh, I, I, I want him to have a job because I can't afford uh, for him to go to the university. I saw it over and over. And then I said to myself, what about if I could help these children study engineering and medicine? What about if Boson Chin become the largest producer of engineers and medical um, graduates within the next 10, 15 years? And what about if when I retire, I get 100 engineers to come and visit me one day. I just got excited. Then <laughs> I decided to call my friends in the US and say, hey, I have this new idea, new dream. Can you support me? I really want to do this. I want to do something that has never been done before. My friends got excited. Uh, I used my personal resources, the other resources. We teamed up and sent 60 students the first, uh, no, 40 students the first year. The next year, about 60 students came, and, and this year, about 30. I'm told other applications have come. We may end up with 140, um, maybe about 30 of them in medical school and the rest in engineering. I'm super excited. New Year's Day, they came to, they came to my house. I was so happy, 85 of them, and we had a nice conversation. Saw them off to go back to school. And I'm going to, majority of them are at UMAT, Takwa. I'm going to be visiting them um, just to see how they are doing and, and see the university. There are some IUDFs doing engineering and uh, doing medicine. And um, I know what education can do. My own story is a story of coming from nowhere, getting opportunity, going to America, building school for Americans and looking at myself and saying to myself, if I can I help others, why don't I do that? But I also know I'm not the Minister for Education, so it cannot just be Wilson Train. So I reached out to BOST, and they decided to sponsor 50 students who come from areas, areas that are impacted by BOST. So my staff went around the country with BOST, went to communities in Bogatanga and other places in Kumasi, areas that BOST have operations, and selected 50 students. And those students are also in a rural scholarship program, and they are at uh, Takwa. Uh, recently, I've gotten a number of companies that want to do the same. So our goal is to look for students in Zungo community, students in um, inner city, rural areas, who are sitting at home, sometimes two, three years, after graduation and begin to look at how to support them. We're also looking at a more systemic solution uh, to the challenge, mm. and that is uh, to change the way we apply for student loans. What we want to do, and they have begun, is that students can apply to, for student loans when they submit their application to universities. So by the time university decide whether they may accept it or not, the student loan has also been approved conditionally. Okay. So there's an alignment. Mm. Because the reason why you still have children in the villages and they are not going is that they don't know where to get the money from. They have to go to the university and second term or semester is when they can apply for student loans. So it's not matching. So what cabinets has now approved that we do is to create a system that allows students to apply for the student loans at the same time that they are applying for admission to the universities so that there will be an alignment. Uh, so when we do that systemic kind of uh, change, and then scholarship secretariat also uh, do the same thing, get fund, local scholarship also do the same, then we are better able to meet the needs of those who are less privileged, who otherwise will stay at home and don't go uh, mm. to the universities. Right. Let me say thank you so much for speaking to us, Dr. Yaosei Duchum. Hopefully, we will be back here in a few days 
when you're able to give us an update um, on some of the things that we spoke about. But let me say that we are grateful that you could make time to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh,